So um, Jennifer was at a little bit of a higher altitude. I'm going to take it down a bit lower, like to maybe two feet. Um, so uh, I usually have a slides so that I have lots of numbers and charts and geeky techy things, and I'm not going to disappoint you again this year. So first slide. Wait a minute. Ah, there we go. So this is a very important slide. Everyone should really be scanning it quite closely because it's one of the more important things that you all do with Crossref, and that is deposit metadata with us. Uh, this represents the number of transactions depositing metadata with Crossref since January. Um, you can see what the, uh, what the response time is here in terms of how quickly it takes to get a file processed when you send it to Crossref. Uh, many of you may note that in March we had a little bit of a problem and uh, things kind of got away from us. And so we, uh, are, we, we have ways that we can handle this and manage this kind of stuff. But by and large, you'll note that most of the transactions that interact with Crossref to deposit metadata happen in under an hour. And, and really, many happen in under 30 minutes, which many are also within minutes. So the depositing of metadata is a fairly complex process. And a lot of you uh, send in updates to your metadata. Um, you're fixing things, you're moving articles around, you're changing the URLs, this is all good stuff. Um, it's essential stuff that has to happen to make, uh, to make the, the metadata system work. And so I just want to point out that uh, the volumes are rather large and our response time in handling it is, uh, I think, pretty good. I, I do have to make apologies for March and April a little bit. But this is really the key thing that, that my team focuses on. So um, just want, wanted to point that out. Another thing that goes on all the time is query matching and uh, the performance of those queries. And so this is where people, where you are trying to find the DOI that goes with a specific reference. And you're trying to put that link up on your website. You're trying to fill in the roadmap, as Jennifer said. And so matching is all a machine activity, and so accuracy is very, very important. We can't really make mistakes here. I can't tell you the DOI if it's not the right DOI. We don't want that link going to the wrong place. And so the query matching uh, performance has been really quite good in the last year or so. We've made some changes a year ago that have uh, made things run nice and smoothly from a speed perspective. The, the blue line at the bottom represents about 250 milliseconds, which is the time it takes to query. So that's been rock steady for a long time. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, th the red line shows the volume of activity. Um, and, and that's all over the place, depending on the day of the week and the month of the year. And the green line, which represents the matching one, is the one that really got, has to get some focus now. Um, it's not as high as it ought to be. Um, we made some changes to our logging and our data collection in the late summer so that we've been collecting some data telling us why things aren't matching. And uh, we're going to be really taking a hard look at that stuff in the very near future. So I think it's, it's, uh, it, the, the, the time has come again to look at this really hard. And so that's, that's uh, in, the, in the very near future. In terms of, you know, I'm, I'm a tech op. We, we maintain the oper operations of, of a Crossref system. And from an availability perspective, uh, deposit availability is not five nines, but, you know, it's, pretty darn close, and given what we spend for uh, our operations, we're getting some, I think, really good performance out of uh, availability from, from a deposit point of view. So 30-day, 100%, 90-day, uh, 99.997, 90 and for the last year, it's been 9986. So anybody who runs a system, I think, would, would agree that these numbers are good. They're, they're very respectable. Uh, query availability, pretty much the same thing. Uh, 99,999 for the last 90 days. So uh, the, the team has built a, a very robust and reliable system, and, and, but we're not going to stop working on it. We're going to keep plugging away to make things even better, like I mentioned before, query matching. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of the operational stuff. Um, I want to mention a few highlights for 2015, and, and there's many things that could have gone on this list. Uh, no, you know, if I had an hour, I could keep on going with things. But this was this is a few of the, the more important things, things that I thought might be important to talk about. And so I've got a few slides on each of them, um, and a couple um, 
not so much, but uh, let, let me go through them all and then I'll touch on the ones that don't get a lot of coverage when we get to the end. So uh, ORCID round trip. This was a very big initiative this year. I think it's a very high visibility thing for, or for, for Crossref. Um, I, it's, it's garnered a lot of excitement in the, uh, in the various channels and communication things that we monitor, and rightly so. I think this is uh, a, a perfect example of how the scholarly infrastructure works well uh, with many players participating. So what is ORCID Round Trip? So you as publishers collect manuscripts from authors and hopefully when you do, you are collecting the ORCID for the author. And uh, that is part of the metadata that you supply to Crossref. Um, once you give that metadata to Crossref, we then ask the author at ORCID uh, for permission to post works to their uh, profile, to their record. Um, the initial request goes to ORCID in a relatively new API that they have developed uh, recently. And it goes into the author's inbox in their ORCID login screen. This is not an email, um, but it's a, it's a messaging system. Um, periodically, ORCID does gather up things that the author should know about and will email the author uh, at a rate at which the author has control over. And uh, at that point, we wait. We're waiting for the author to come back and, and give us permission. And they can give us permission directly via the email that's in their email system, whatever it happens to be. Or they can log on to ORCID and give us permission via a button in the message in their inbox. But anyway, it, however that happens, um, permission gets granted to Crossref. And now Crossref will start pushing those works into the author's record automatically. And in this case, uh, the article ABC is the article that triggered this event. But we will push, once, given, once we've gotten permission, ABC along with any other articles by any other publishers that have this ORCID. So we're, we've, got, uh, we've, we've been given the permission to push data directly into the author's profile. So as of November 10th, I think this went live end of October. Jenny, do you know, have the date? October 20th. October, October 20th was the date. Uh, then it went live. Now, we have been collecting orchids with author metadata for a long time, actually for well over a year. Uh, but as of November 10th, uh, 9,800 authors have granted us permission, 338 of which were short-term, which is a little bit puzzling. Um, when we ask for permission, we ask the author, can we do this for like a long time, like forever? And... Um, they can, they can give us that permission, and most of them apparently do, but some have said, no, you can do it for just a little while. And so that little while is like less than a day. Then we have, uh, so as a result of these permissions, we've pushed 11,784 works to various authors' profiles. In the meantime, we have over half a million ORCID article pairs, and I, what that means is some, some articles have more than one ORCID identified to it, so uh, we actually have 272,000 unique articles that we have ORCIDs for, but we have 539,000 uh, ORCID article pairs waiting in the wings to go. Uh, and we haven't made a decision yet on exactly when or how we're going to push the backlog uh, into ORCID profiles, but we're going slow. Just we don't want any... Uh, any uh, major issues, but I will have to say that uh, the experience so far with the implementation has been smooth, incredibly smooth, so very happy with that. Uh, 20,000 authors have not responded to our permission requests, and 96 have denied permission. So this is something we need to keep an eye on real close. You know, how long does it take these 20,000 to respond? You know, do they ever respond? Uh, this was one of the concerns of the group when we were formulating this plan was what if authors just ignore this completely. So um, technically, it's working beautifully. The social aspect, we still have to learn a little bit how, about how this works. So in the ORCID round trip, you supply, you publishers supply the ORCID with the author when you, when you give us your metadata. That's all you have to do. That's it. Um, not, not a real complicated thing. Um, the 
best practice is to validate the author's ORCID when, when you collect it. And that means making, having them log on to ORCID, essentially, so that you're, you're confirming that that author is indeed that, that ORCID. They can log in, and, and, and this, this helps prevent uh, sending notifications to the wrong people. So that's the best practice. Here's a bad practice. And this doesn't just pertain to ORCIDs. It's a metadata criticism uh, overall that I'll, I'll, I'll put on the table right now. Um, this depositor, this publisher, gave us the same ORCID for every one of the authors in the article, which we know is impossible. So uh, please pay attention. Please really look at your processes and your automation and what's going on. And, and help us prevent this kind of stuff from happening. So another thing that uh, started this year uh, in the Crossref Funder Data uh, Program, uh, I'm not quite sure how to say that yet without saying Fundref, um, is a Funder ID auto insertion. And so many, many funders are, many, many uh, deposits are taking place where you're giving us funding information and, but you're not giving us the, uh, the ID, the registry ID. Uh, and so we've implemented some technology where we're going to look at the name that you give us for the funding body, and we're going to try to match it to an ID. And if we can match it to an ID with a high degree of confidence, we're going to insert the ID for you. And so that is happening uh, right now. And so you send us metadata sans IDs, we stick them in. Um, and there's, there's an example of, uh, of the ID actually getting uh, inserted. We mark that insertion with the provider equals crossref, so people will know that this is crossref putting this ID in here, not the publisher. Um, just some stats there. The, in September, we inserted 16,000 IDs, October 18,000, and the, uh, the number of uh, ID deposited by the publishers were 35,000 and 42,000. It's getting a little kind of crunched there on the screen. So automatic ID insertion of, fund ref, of funder IDs. That's, that's taking place right now. Uh, this is the first time Crossref has ever touched the metadata being deposited. Another new thing is uh, DOI relations. Uh, this is uh, something that will help build that map that Jennifer was talking about. Um, when a DOI cites another DOI, that's a relationship. Something cites is cited by. That's a, that's a bi bilateral uh, relationship. We've been doing that for a long time, quite successful. Uh, but DOI relations is going to allow people to define relations between things for other reasons. And so here's a case where two DOIs exist for an article. Yes, this is legal. That article is published in a different language in these two cases. And so the original language has a DOI, and the translated language article has another DOI. This mechanism now allows those two things to be related. And as we move downstream into things like DET, this is the kind of information that we want to populate that system with. So here's the avenue by which you can make that happen. So DOI relations, this is just a quick look at uh, what the metadata looks like. If you interrogate either DOI, you can learn about who it is related to. That's, that's the intent of this and uh, where it will go. Uh, note that only the article making the claim that the, re that the relationship exists is the one that needs to do a deposit. The one that is being uh, affected, the target, if you will, doesn't have to do anything. Doesn't have to, you don't have to deposit this stuff both ways just one side makes the relationship. We will establish the bidirectionality of that relationship. So relations, uh, that, this is very new. Another thing we did this year was uh, conflicts. We've, for a long, long time, we've had an issue with conflicts in the system, and we've we picked away at it and tried to make it better and improve the way the system operates in the face of conflicts. And, and this is where two DOIs get created for the exact same metadata. Okay. Um, and this is a problem. And so it occurs many times when publishers are moving articles and moving tr journals between platforms, um, and it essentially causes a fair amount of grief. We're getting better at handling it, but this simplification is huge. And the fact that we've reduced the way it used to be done from a very complicated, it had some advantages, but very complicated model to a very simple model. 
So this is going to make it much more simple for all of us to manage the situation uh, with conflicts. There's been a number of new services built into the metadata uh, deposit process, and this is just one of them. Um, you make a deposit of an article and you give us your references and we match those references and that's what makes cited by linking work. But you want to get back your own article with your own set of references and, hey, what, what DOIs did you find, Crossref, for my references? And so this is just a simple little interface where you can query your own DOI and we'll give you back the references that we made for your, the DOIs that we found for your references. Um, there's a number of these, these little things. They're all kind of all over the place. As, as Jennifer did mention, uh, our documentation is not exactly clear on these points all the time, and, and that hopefully is going to get rectified in the, in the coming year. But this is an, a, another uh, nice little service. Uh, book co-access. This, this is a service that's been around for a while, but was launched only this year. It's a rather complicated approach to allowing multiple hosts of the same content to essentially assign DOIs to their content without having to coordinate with or know about the other provider. And this is a very common thing in the book space, and uh, it's actually uh, live now. We're in a pilot with uh, uh, Johns Hopkins Press and uh, CUP, I think, uh, or JSTOR, one of those two. Um, accepting, accepting deposits and see how it works with this automatic multiple resolution uh, function. That's essentially what's going on here. So this, this is new. Another new thing is the deposit fee change. Um, for large volumes of DOIs, uh, we are now charging a far lower fee for the deposit of those DOIs. Um, the fees do, the, fee, the change in the fee structure really hasn't affected anyone yet. So a few publishers have creeped into the upper tiers and, and gotten some lower prices in their deposit fees, but no one has yet deposited, you know, a million components in a given quarter. Uh, but if they were, the, the, the price has now gone from six cents to less than half, a, to a half a cent. Um, so we're hoping that this encourages uh, participation in cross in a slightly different uh, way in which we've seen in the past. Um, so this, this went into effect uh, and during the, thir the third quarter billing cycle reflected this change. Ongoing infrastructure management, this, this is just something you all, we all do all the time. I'm sure you all know about your, de your technical departments. They're constantly pushing and maintaining the infrastructure to keep things operating properly. Um, we moved the, uh, some of the labs features and some of the lab services, the REST API and the cross ref metadata search. Um, that functionality is now running co-resident within the, uh, the data center and the, and the, and the equipment that is part of the, quote, main system. Um, and what that does is it gives uh, us the opportunity to put more people on it. We cross-train now a number of different individuals who know about this service, who will respond to problems, and will help to maintain it. And it, I, th I think it's uh, done a really nice job of helping to bring the, the, the UK and the, and the US team even closer um, to work really tight on, on some of these specific initiatives. So this is happening within the, uh, the bowels of the technical teams at Crossref, um, and this is a very good thing. You, so I just want to make sure you all, you, you all know about that. And I think that's the last slide I have. So I just want to make sure I covered all the topics. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I did, I did, I did touch on everything. So that's it. Uh, do we have any questions? Want to handle some questions? Okay. Uh, I think Jeff is up next.